David Kestenbaum, NPR News. Thanks for being with us this morning at NPR News. There's much more coming up later today on All Things Considered. morning edition from NPR News. Thanks for listening to Colorado Public Radio. You can go to cprnews.org to keep up with a lot of Colorado news and everything we're working on. There's a conversation with Denver City Councilwoman Susan Shepard, who went to McAllen, Texas, near the Mexican border, to see firsthand the efforts to help some of the Central American children who've been coming into the U.S. You can also see why rents around the Denver area keep getting higher. Those are a couple of stories at cprnews.org. news from around the world and around our state. This is Colorado Public Radio online at CPR.org. Support comes from the Arvada Center, presenting the Broadway musical Memphis, September 9th through 28th. A story based on actual events with music and dancing set to 50s rock and roll. More at ArvadaCenter.com. Keep Colorado Public Radio in the loop. If you make monthly contributions with a credit or debit card and you've received a new card, please take just a moment to update your payment information. Better yet, become an Evergreen partner using your checking account so you never have to worry about expired or replaced cards again. Visit CPR.org to become an Evergreen partner or call 1-800-722-4449 to update your credit or debit card today. Thank you. Today's weather forecast looks a lot like yesterday's. Partly cloudy for Metro Denver, the chance for thunderstorms through the afternoon and overnight, and pretty much the same thing for tomorrow. Metro highs in the upper 80s this afternoon, then a few degrees cooler on Friday. It should stay close to 80 around Denver tomorrow. This is Colorado Public Radio. Around the state, 80s today in Fort Collins and Grand Junction, near 90 in Pueblo, 60s around Vail and Aspen. We begin NPR's business news in China's foreign car market. Toyota, the Japanese automaker, said today that it will lower prices of auto parts for its luxury Lexus models in China. This comes after Chinese regulators raised concerns over possible antitrust in the country's auto industry. Critics say authorities there are targeting foreign companies more heavily than Chinese firms since passing an antitrust law in 2008. The price cuts will kick in at the beginning of September and follow similar moves by German car makers. There's been a big debate at the Federal Reserve about when to begin raising its closely watched interest interest rate. That debate continued at the Fed's most recent meeting late last month. Minutes from that meeting are out, and they have some things to tell us. NPR's John Itzde reports. The most recent forecast from Fed officials suggests the first rate hike is likely to come sometime in the second half of next year. But former Fed Governor Randall Krosner says minutes of the Fed's recent meeting show a number of officials believe the central bank should begin raising rates sooner. Some Fed members believe that there's not very much slack in the economy, the unemployment rate is coming down, and that we need to move quickly. But the minutes also reveal that a majority of policymakers, including Fed Chair Janet Yellen, 
are looking beyond improvements in the unemployment rate and believe the labor market still needs the Fed's help. Jenny Gellin is focusing on long-term unemployed, people who are part-time workers who prefer to be full-time, looking at the very low level of labor force participation. And looking at those factors suggests that there's still a long way to go for the labor market to recover. So far, subdued inflation has allowed the Fed to continue its stimulative low interest rate policy. But Krosner cautions that inflation can become a threat quickly in an improving economy. John Itzti, NPR News, Washington. Now, officials from the Fed are gathering again today along with some of their foreign counterparts. They are attending Kansas City Fed's annual symposium in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. For a preview, we turn, as we often do, to David Wessel of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal. David, great to talk to you again. Good morning. So you've covered the Fed's Jackson Hole Conference many times before. It gets a lot of attention. Is that just because it's this gorgeous mountain spot? Yes, that's definitely part okay, of it. Right. <laughs> it's easier to get people to go to the, the Grand Tetons in August than to, say, a, a ballroom in Manhattan. Yeah, I can imagine. And the TV cameras just love the backdrop, you know, a dull-looking Federal Reserve official with the mountains in the back. <laughs> it, it's also very exclusive. You have to be invited. The formal sessions are are not live-streamed or broadcast, so if you're not in the room, you can't know what's going on. And on top of that, the conference has in the past been the venue for some very influential academic papers. And and importantly, during the financial crisis, Ben Bernanke, then the Fed chairman, used it as a forum to send some pretty important messages about the direction of monetary policy. Now, this year, the focus is on the job market. Janet Yellen, the new Fed chair, is going to talk about that tomorrow morning. But there may actually be more attention on what Mario Draghi, the president of the European Central Bank, has to say, given the latest round of disappointing economic news from Europe. Okay, given that context and given that jobs are, are big on the economic agenda, what, what exactly are central bankers focusing on right now? Well, even the titles of the papers and the academics who are giving them are embargoed until tonight. Huh. Somehow, this new Fed transparency hasn't quite penetrated the Kansas City Fed yet. But there are a couple of salient issues. There's a lot of debate about how much damage the Great Recession did to the job market and to workers, how much uh, we're seeing today in youth unemployment, long-term unemployment, idle middle-aged men not even looking for work, sluggish weight increases, all that stuff. How much is a long-term trend and how much can be undone once the world economy heals. As John Itzi said, for the Fed, the big issue now is how quickly the job market is healing, and thus how soon should the Fed begin to move interest rates up. You know, it's been keeping interest rates at zero since December 2008, and the signals are they're going to stay there at least until the middle of next year. You know, you mentioned wage increases being sluggish. I mean, even in an economy, that sounds like something the Fed would be worried about. Is there anything the Fed can do to, to actually help in, in terms of wages? Well, you're right. The Fed is worried about it. Janet Yellen has talked about it. The Fed tracks wage trends closely, in part because they're an important inflation indicator, but they're also a reflection of how close the economy is to full capacity. And also, in a well-functioning economy, wages should be rising, particularly when productivity is going up. And the latest government data show average hourly earnings adjusted for inflation have not increased at all in the last year, even though we're told the economy is getting better and other wage measures show similar trends. Now, the Fed really can't do anything to get wages up. What what it can do is wait to raise interest rates until the job market's healthier, and that's what they're debating now. Should they wait a while longer, or some people are getting restless? David, this is the kind of place where I could imagine people, you know, enjoying the outdoors and golfing and having drinks and dinner, but, but a lot of actually substantive conversation going on at those things. That's right. The cocktail parties and the hiking and golf, people do talk about stuff. I think what they're going to be talking about is how soon will the Fed raise interest rates, and are the people who want to raise them sooner getting trapped? action inside the Fed's policy committee. But I'll bet much of the conversation will be about Europe. When the Bank of England would raise interest rates, they're going to probably move before the Fed. And how sick is the European banking system? And what can the European Central Bank do to get their Eurozone economy back on track? They're really having a hard time, and they're suffering a lot from the sanctions imposed on and by Russia in connection with the Ukraine. All right. We've been speaking with David Wessel. He's director of the Hutchins Center at the Brookings Institution, also a contributor at the Wall Street Journal. David, thanks as always. You're welcome. And our last word in business is awesome. The Awesome Mix Volume 1 is for the second week in a row number one on the Billboard 200 album chart. This is the soundtrack for Marvel's blockbuster space opera Guardians of the Galaxy. What's unusual is that the songs on the album are, well, they're kind of old. <laughs> What 
Cop 1974. Yeah, all the songs are from the 60s and 70s. And last week, according to Nielsen SoundScan, the compilation sold 93,000 copies. I'm guessing digital copies and CDs, but probably no 8-tracks. Or maybe. Cassettes. Oh, that's the business news for Morning Edition on NPR News. I'm David Green. And I'm Kelly McEvers. across Colorado staying warm today then getting a little cooler for Friday. This is Colorado Public Radio. Partly cloudy for the Denver area and in Boulder. Temperatures in the upper 80s this afternoon around Metro Denver and in Fort Collins. Chance for thunderstorms uh, late in the day and overnight and then temperatures dropping a little bit for Friday. Highs will be close to 80 degrees around the Denver area tomorrow. In the mountains today some rain and highs in the 60s. We are coming up on 10 this morning here on KCFR FM Denver and KCFC Boulder on HD at 90.1 FM and online at CPR.org. In-depth news from Colorado Public Radio. Support comes from Formula Roofing, specializing in all types of roof installation, repair, and more. Formula Roofing is family owned and operated. Learn more at formularoofing.com. Support comes from Porchlight Real Estate Group. With five neighborhood offices throughout Metro Denver, Porchlight provides residential real estate services personally tailored to each client. On the web at porchlightgroup.com. Streaming Colorado Public Radio is as easy as going to CPR.org and clicking on the listen bar at the bottom of your computer screen. Your Colorado Public Radio news, CPR classical, or open air, all at CPR.org. Colorado Public Radio, this is Colorado Matters. It sounds like a story straight out of the 1800s, uproar over a freak show. But little Liz, a woman who's just over two feet tall, was cast out of the Boulder County Fair, only to land a gig at the State Fair in Pueblo. We'll talk about the history of sideshows and the precarious place they occupy today. Then, Hispanic turnout may be quite low this election, and not just because it's a midterm, but because there's been no movement on immigration reform. And as each election goes by that they turn out in pretty solid numbers and nothing happens, I think their enthusiasm to continue turning out to the polls drops. Plus, Anne Frank's stepsister is coming to Colorado to talk about Frank's fame diary. It's one of the events Chloe Feldman suggests in her weekend arts room. And vodka is not just for cocktails. It's role in pie making after the news. From NPR News in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. The two American aid workers who were infected with Ebola in West Africa and treated in the United States are now out of the hospital in Atlanta. Nancy Ripoll and Dr. Kent Brantley have both tested clear of the virus that has stricken thousands in several West African nations in recent months. This morning, Brantley spoke of the first moments he and his team heard that Ebola had arrived in Guinea. In March, when we got word that Ebola was in Guinea and had spread to Liberia, we began preparing for the worst. We did not receive our first Ebola patient until June, but when she arrived, we were ready. A doctor at Atlanta's Emory University Hospital, where the aid workers were treated, says in the U.S. Ebola poses no public health risk. It's uncertain if the patients recovered on their own or as a result of an experimental treatment they were given. Attorney General Eric Holder says he may have traveled to Ferguson, Missouri this week to diffuse tensions, but it's the people of Ferguson who is giving him hope. NPR's Kerry Johnson reports on the ongoing civil rights investigation into the shooting of an unarmed 18-year-old man. The Attorney General asked for patience with the course of the federal probe. Investigators have interviewed more than 200 people in connection with the death of black teenager Michael Brown at the hands of a white police officer. Eric Holder says the experience 
Mike Ferguson moved him. I've seen a lot in my time as Attorney General, but few things have affected me as greatly as my visit to Ferguson. Holder says there's a role for law enforcement in helping to restore calm and peace to communities. There is a history to these tensions, and that history simmers in more communities than just Ferguson. He says there's a real opportunity for reform there and across the nation. Carrie Johnson, NPR News, Washington. It's been a year since hundreds of people were killed in a chemical attack in Syria. The U.S. still blames the attack on forces loyal to Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad, a claim that the regime continues to deny. This, while Human Rights Watch declares there are still unanswered questions on who was behind the chemical attack. Here's NPR's Alice Ford. The watchdog says no one has been held to account for the attacks. The group's analysis of video footage and fragments of weapons found Assad's forces were responsible. Nine days after the attack, the U.S. government also released an assessment based partially on an intercepted Syrian communication, blaming the Assad government and estimating more than 1,400 people were killed, though other assessments were lower. A proposal to use military force was discussed in Congress and then dropped. Eventually, Assad agreed to hand over all Syria's chemical weapons stocks for destruction, a process completed just this week. But Human Rights Watch's Nadine Puri says closure of the chemical weapons issue in Syria will be possible only when those who ordered and executed the Ghouta attacks have been held to account and are behind bars. Alice Fordham, NPR News, Beirut. Dow's up 70 points. This is NPR. This is Colorado Public Radio News. I'm Mike Lamb. Colorado voters will decide whether genetically modified food has to be identified on food labels in the state. The Secretary of State's office confirmed Wednesday that supporters collected enough signatures to put Proposition 105 on the ballot. State lawmakers rejected a proposal for voluntary labeling earlier this year. Three New England states have passed GMO labeling laws. Rents in the Denver area grew at the second fastest rate in the country from July 2013 to this past July. Rents rose 9% on average. Jay Denton is with the Texas-based research firm Axiometrics that compiled the data. He says rents in the Denver area have climbed at an above-average rate for about four years now. We keep waiting for it at some point to slide down the list a little bit just because growth has been so strong, but it really just continues to amaze as one of the top markets for effective grain growth in the country. The strongest growth was in Aurora, where increases were 10 to 15 percent. While Colorado is having a fairly quiet fire season, a new U.S. Department of Agriculture report says the cost of fighting wildfires is taking money away from other forest programs. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack is renewing his call on Congress to treat wildfires like other natural disasters, so funding does not have to be moved from other projects. He says that's not sustainable for several reasons. Not enough money in the overall forest budget, complicated by a shift within that budget away from vegetation and wildlife habitat management, recreational wilderness activities towards fire suppression. He says the average number of fires on federal lands has more than doubled since 1980, and the total area burned annually has tripled. This is Colorado Public Radio. Support for NPR comes from CarMax, offering more than 35,000 used cars and trucks, online and in stores from coast to coast. Learn more at CarMax.com. Follow CPR News on Facebook and Twitter to join the discussion about today's news and share thoughts and opinions about the latest Colorado stories we're covering. You can also stay connected to the Colorado music community and get updates on cultural news and events when you follow CPR Classical and Open Air. Visit us online at CPR.org and click on the Facebook and Twitter icons to keep you connected to Colorado Public Radio online. Colorado Matters from CPR News. I'm Ryan Warner. Little Liz, who's just over two feet tall, appears in sideshows that bill her as the world's smallest woman. And she caused a stir at the Boulder County Fair earlier this month. Parents complained that the show was disturbing to children. A county official also noted that, quote, it factor. And fair managers shut the attraction down. But Little Liz will be in business again in Pueblo at the Colorado State Fair, which opens Friday. She has performed there before. You know, I've thought this over and over since I saw what Boulder did. It's the way this lady makes her living, and I don't know what principle I stand on to deny her the right. This wise one is general manager of the state fair. Are some people uncomfortable with this? They very well could be. Well, don't go in there. Today, we're going to talk about so-called freak shows. Our guide is Robert Bogdan. 
He's a professor of social sciences at Syracuse University and author of the book Freak Show. It explores the lives of people who appear in sideshows. Bogdan says in the United States, the idea...